In this next module, we're going to edit two paragraphs. I'm going to lay out the logical structure of the paragraphs and use that logical structure to help guide my editing. I'm actually going to write out formal outlines for the logical structure of each paragraph. I don't normally do that in my writing and editing, but I think it will be helpful here to explicitly write out the logical structure using formal outlines. Here's the first example. This is from a published scientific paper. Uh, in the paper, scientists uh, had had participants smell a bunch of different perfume scents in the laboratory and rate them on a sliding scale uh, from 0 to 10, where 10 means you really liked the scent. Then they measured the participants' genes, and they tried to determine whether a person's preference for various scents correlates uh, with their genetics. So that was the experiment. I pulled this paragraph from the limitations section of that paper. And now I want you to take a moment and pause the video and read this paragraph on your own, and then restart the video. The point of this paragraph is that the authors are addressing a concern about the choice of the concentrations for the perfume scents in their experiment. It turns out that when there's a really high concentration of a scent, it's so intense and overpowering that most people will just be turned off to that scent. So you don't want to put everything at too high of a concentration. In this paragraph, they're trying to convince the reader that they chose the right concentrations because uh, one, they standardized to a reference substance. And two, they got a reasonable amount of variation in the participants' preferences for the scents, suggesting that none of the scents were universally overpowering. I want to point out a few things about this paragraph. Notice all the sentences that begin with transition words. We have nevertheless, hence, however, interestingly. So there's a lot of telling the reader, hey, I'm going here, I'm going there. If you need to keep telling the reader where you're going, this usually indicates problems with the underlying logic. Another quick thing I want to point out is that I noticed a spelling error in the paragraph. This is the kind of spelling error that your word processing program might fail to pick up. It uh, says the final concentra concentrations were in principle. This is the wrong principle. Remember, principle ends in P-A-L, pal. And that's how you can remember that this principle means the principle of a school, because the principal is your pal. What the authors actually wanted here was principle ending in P-L-E, not the principle of a school, but a principle as in a fundamental tenet. One thing I want to point out in this paragraph is that the authors stuck some extra thoughts inside of parentheses. Interestingly, I really liked the stuff that was in the parentheses. That was where the authors were being most clear, simple, and direct. They clarify for the reader, meaning that people could decide whether they liked a scent or not. Ah, oh, as soon as they say it so plainly, now I get it. And we get, people agreed largely on the quality of these two scents. Again, everything suddenly becomes clear and simple when you put it that way. So I'm going to try to take this clear and simple language and get it out of the parentheses and have the rest of the paragraph uh, read more like this. When I edit a paragraph like this, I start by approaching it from a high level. I take a big picture view. I just try to figure out what is it that the authors were trying to say. Now, I don't actually usually write out a formal outline. I, I usually just do this in my head, but I wanted to write it down here to make it very explicit. I believe that the main idea of this paragraph is to address potential criticisms about the choice of perfume concentrations. The authors are writing about this in the limitations section of their manuscript. They're basically just trying to answer the question, were the perfume concentrations in the experiment appropriate? The first point they bring up is they address the issue about concentration. If concentrations are too high, a smell can become too intense and too overpowering, and it might be uniformly aversive just because of this. So we have to worry about very high concentrations. They defend their experiment against this potential pitfall by noticing that they standardize the intensity. So they're saying it shouldn't be a problem here. The second major point they make is that one way to tell whether or not the concentrations were appropriate 
is to look at how much variation there is in participant preference. Presumably, if they got the concentrations right, there'd be a wide variation in participant preference. It wouldn't be like all the participants hated the scent because it was too overpowering. And the authors say, hey, this appeared to be true. We got good variation for most scents uh, with two exceptions. So those are the main points that the authors were trying to convey. The goal of my editing is going to be to bring out all of those main ideas in simple language. I want to get rid of everything that doesn't contribute to those main ideas. Using this outline, it makes it a lot easier to do a good edit. So I went ahead and I edited this down to the following. I reduced it from 212 words to 91 words. It reads, perfume intensity and quality are negatively correlated at high concentrations. If the scent is too strong, people will rate it unfavorably. Hence, we chose the final concentrations of each perfume ingredient so that it had similar intensity to our reference scent. The resulting concentrations appeared appropriate for most scents, as participants' preferences varied along the sliding scale between 0 and 10. However, participants largely agreed on bergamot and vetiver, so lower or higher concentrations may have been needed for these scents. You can see that I have edited this down to match my outline. I get across just those key points and I remove all the clutter that's detracting from those key points. And you can check back to the outline and make sure that we hit all of these main points. You'll see that it matches very closely. Again, I don't expect you to write out formal outlines like this, but you need to think through the logic this carefully in your head. All right, one more example that we can edit. I'm, uh, this one's a little bit easier to understand, but I'm going to ask you again to pause the video, read it through on your own, and then restart the video. Okay, I think this one's a little bit easier to follow than the last example. It's basically just a compare-contrast comparing classic epidemiology to clinical epidemiology. So I went ahead and made a formal outline. I think the main idea of the paragraph is just to say that classic and clinical epidemiology differ. It's going to tell you how they differ. And then they have to say uh, what is classic epidemiology and what is clinical epidemiology. They're going to point out, uh, again, it's a compare contrast, they're going to point out the differences between those two things. And then within each of those, uh, they, they used a word that might need a definition. So in talking about classic epidemiology, they use the word etiology. In talking about clinical epidemiology, they use the word prognosis. And the author felt like uh, they needed to define those words for the reader. So it's a pretty simple structure that we have here. And what I'm going to do for this example is actually I'm going to go through and uh, do some sentence level editing now for you as well as we try to edit this down and get just to these main ideas. All right, so for this example, I'm going to walk you through my sentence level editing. We'll start with the first sentence. Although the methodological approaches are similar, the questions posed in classic epidemiology and clinical epidemiology are different. You can hear the wordiness here, so we can get rid of some of this wordiness. We could just say, uh, I think we can get rid of all of this. How about we just say, despite? similarities that captures all of uh, everything that's in there uh, despite similarities I don't think we need to say the questions posed that's very wordy how about we just say despite similarities classic epidemiology and clinical epidemiology are different and we can do a little better than are different we can just say they differ and if we want to get that idea of differing about questions we could say they differ in aim that's my putting back the, the questions posed part. So we can edit that down to despite methodologic similarities, classic epidemiology and clinical epidemiology differ in aim. And we've hit now the main idea of the paragraph. All right, in the next few sentences, I want to point out that the authors have used parallel sentence structure across multiple sentences. This is great. They just need to bring it out a bit more. Notice the structure here. They say, in classic epidemiology, epidemiologists pose a question about the etiology of a disease in a population of people. 
Well, later on, we get something very similar. In clinical epidemiology, clinicians pose a question about the prognosis of a disease in a population of patients. Notice the parallel structure. What we get is in discipline one, group one poses a question about uh, X in a population of people. And that's very similar to what we get later. We get some interim garbage here, but then we get to in discipline two, group two poses a question about Y in a population of patients. So we have this nice parallel structure that's going to help with paragraph flow. And notice there's a transition uh, phrase here on the other hand. We don't really need that transition phrase because we can use the parallel structure to help with flow. We're just going to need to bring it out a bit more. So I'm going to do my sentence level editing now on these few sentences. Um, I'm going to change this and say, make it a little bit shorter by saying classic epidemiologists uh, pose a question about the etiology of a disease in a population of people. I am going to get rid of all this stuff about causal associations for now because I want to get right to that parallel uh, sentence. And uh, later I'll put back in a little definition of etiology, but we can do it much more quickly. Then I'm going to remove, on the other hand, we don't need that transition anymore because we have these, this nice parallel setup. And then I'm going to say, uh, in clinical epidemiology, again, I'll change that to clinical epidemiologists to be, remain parallel with the first sentence. Clinical, clinical epidemiologists pose a question about the prognosis of a disease in a population of patients. So that reduces nicely down to this nice uh, uh, shorter version. Classic epidemiologists pose a question about the etiology of a disease in a population of people. Clinical epidemiologists pose a question about the prognosis of a disease in a population of patients. We get that nice parallel structure and we've hit A and B on the outline now. We've compared and contrasted clinical to classical epidemiology. All right, one more sentence to go here. Uh, that last uh, sentence was just a definition of prognosis. You can see that there's a lot that can be cut in this sentence. So we get prognosis can be regarded as, uh, we can just say is instead of can be regarded as. And then we get a set of outcomes and their associated probabilities following the occurrence of, this is all very wordy. I'm just going to change this to prognosis is the probability. the probability uh, that an event that an event or diagnosis will result in a particular outcome. So I've trimmed this up quite a bit and get rid of a lot of this wordiness. So prognosis is the probability that um, an event or diagnosis will result in a particular outcome. I think that's it in a nutshell. And now we've hit upon the definition of prognosis, which was that final point in the outline. So altogether, you'll notice that I did uh, put in a little definition of etiology. I just slipped it in after a semicolon. So we get, uh, despite methodologic similarities, classic epidemiology and clinical epidemiology differ in aim. Classic epidemiologists pose a question about the etiology of disease in a population of people. And here I'm slipping in the definition of etiology. Etiologic factors can be, can be manipulated to prevent disease. Clinical epidemiologists pose a question about the prognosis of a disease in a population of patients. And then I get slip in the definition of prognosis. Prognosis is the probability that an event or diagnosis will result in a particular outcome. And I have cut this down from 111 words down to 65. And you can check back with the outline and you can see that I've hit all the main points on the outline.